Today we're going to talk about uh, frequency and percentage distributions. And let me start that bad boy up. There we go. Uh, looking at frequency and percentage distributions as a way to describe some of our basic statistics. Remember we have a descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. And descriptive statistics are simply trying to describe variability in the data using numbers as a way to do that. So frequency and percentage distributions are going to be one way to do that. We can, for example, transform raw data into univariate frequency distributions. Let me get my pen out. So raw data. This is simply the data that comes into us. It's usually in the, the form of some sort of a, a spreadsheet for quantitative data, or we put it into some sort of table or spreadsheet-like thing. Um, it's usually uh, in you know rows and columns. And in the rows, you have cases. And in the columns, you have variables. Right? That's pretty typical. So the raw data, let me erase that would be initial observations or scores in a data set of some sort. A frequency distribution is an array or a, a, a spread of numbers of cases with each value of a variable or joint values of two or more variables. So it's just a way of visualizing the, the variability in, of values in a variable. Univariate frequency distributions. Univariate simply means one, one variable. Okay. So for example, we could have this data set that we made up, uh, or I made up. We've got the names of students and we've got their year. Uh, let's say it's in high school in the United States. So Jim is a freshman, Julie's a sophomore, Bill's a junior, Betty's a senior. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the American system, uh, freshman is a first year, sophomore is a second year, junior is a third year, and senior is a fourth year. Although we give them these names as a way to indicate where they are in the process. Right? And so we have names of the students and we have this uh, nominal data. This is a nominal data on their year in high school. Okay. And what we can do is we can simply transform that raw data into a univariate frequency distribution. The variable is year. These are the values for our variable. And we're simply counting the frequency. Right? So one way to do it would just be to tally it. There are four freshmen. And if we went back here, and I erased my marks so it would be easier to see. One, two, three, four. Lo and behold, four. <laughs> If we went back and did sophomore, one, two, three, lo and behold, three. And you get how that goes. So if we counted, we would have two juniors and one senior. So the total frequency is actually in this case, it's the number of people in our data set is 10. But for each of the values of our variable, we've got a frequency, All right? That's simply how many times it occurs. Now, if we wanted to transform our univariate frequency distribution into a percentage distribution, it's very easy. Simply divide each frequency by the total number of cases. So, divide each frequency by the total number of cases. Here's the total number, and here's the frequency. So, if we wanted to do a, a percentage distribution for freshmen, right, 4 is the frequency, 10 is the number, it would simply be frequency divided by the number, or 4 divided by 10. Okay. Same thing here, except we're taking it a step further because we're multiplying by 100. It's the frequency divided by the number, and to turn that from a uh, uh, one thing into a percentage, we simply multiply by 100. So here's an example of what that would look like for each of the values for our variable year. Freshman 4 divided by 10 times 100 is 40. 3 divided by 10 times 100 is 30. 2 divided by 10 times 100 is 20. You get where we're going here. Right? So the percent total is 100%. The n, the number total, is 10.
Percentages are simply standardized frequencies. It, it's, it shows us what the frequency would be if we had exactly 100 cases. And we happen to have 10 cases in this, in this situation. But if we had 100 cases, we'd have 40 freshmen and 30 sophomores and 20 juniors and 10 seniors. Also, I'm just going to skip down here. There's a difference between a proportion and a percentage. And that is the difference between this multiplying by 100. This, all by itself, is a proportion. 4 divided by 10 is 0 0.04. That's a proportion. When you multiply it by 100 and you get 40, that is a percentage. All right? So recognize the difference between proportions and percentages and just realize that if you multiply this times 100, you get this. And then finally, beware of small sample sizes, especially less than 30. Now in our sample, in our sample here, we only had 10. That's extremely small. And the reason why is the results from whatever calculations you're doing tend to uh, be more susceptible to bias or skewing or uh, being pulled in a way that isn't completely representative of both the sample and perhaps even the population that was drawn from when you have sample sizes less than 30. So the larger the sample size, the larger the n, usually the better. What if we wanted to do a cumulative percentage distribution? That would simply be the percentage of all the scores that have a given value or less. Very straightforward, simply add all the frequencies for the given value and all of the lesser values. Divide that sum by the total number of cases and multiply that result by 100. All right, so we've just capitalized the F here to represent cumulative frequency rather than just a small f, which was simply frequency. And then we've done the same thing, divide by n, multiply by 100. Let's give an example of what that would look like. So here we have, again, the year. We have freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And we're, we're starting with freshman and then moving up. Okay. So, <clears throat> freshman, 40%. Cumulative of freshman and everything below, 40. Sophomores, we have... 30% of our group of sophomores, but remember the cumulative percentage is everything at that level and below. So 30 plus 40 is 70. Same thing a junior. Juniors are only 20%, but 20 and below is 90. And then finally when you add in seniors, you come to 100%. So you're simply accumulating at each level. So 100 represents all of these 90, these 70, these, and 40 just freshmen. Any questions? <laughs> well, you're not here, so you can't ask me questions. But um, I, I am available via email or uh, in class, so feel free to ask any questions that you have about this. Percentage distributions, whether they're straightforward univariate uh, frequencies or cumulative percentage distributions, are pretty standard ways of representing data, of describing data, because this gives us a very basic but helpful overview of what our distribution of people in high school looks like. Let's shift and talk about how we represent the data visually a little more. Um, there are a ways of making figures or charts or tables uh, any way that you can visually represent data that can uh, really help you understand and describe the data or quite frankly really hurt you <laughs> and uh, really make it difficult to understand or describe the data. So I have, I have 10 recommendations for how you can make the best figures, charts, and tables. One is simply to minimize all the chart or graph junk. I should add graph. Right? That means anything that doesn't need to be there, take it away. Simple is best. Right? Secondly, plan out your chart. Before, you have, uh, before you're putting numbers in it, actually think about what are the cases that would go in the rows, what are the variables that would go in the columns, and try to think about how you would lay it out. 
that's going to really help you or if you if you're doing a bar graph you know, think about what your uh, X and Y axes are supposed to represent and how you want it to flow do you want to go from low to high do you want to go from high to low right so that you could have it something like this or do you want another way of doing it I'm gonna minimize some of my chart junk right now there we go say what you mean and mean what you say that means labeling make sure that you're labeling accurately you'll see some examples in the next slides of how you can do that inaccurately um, but if you are labeling a an axis or a axis or a variable or a bar on a graph or anything you want to make sure that it's as accurate as possible and you want to make sure that you're labeling everything that needs to be labeled don't leave it up to the reader to guess what you're trying to say try to communicate only one idea at a time it's very tempting to have like three or four uh, different ideas floating around um, that you want to for example you might want to see the relationship between four different things and it gets very messy as this little Venn diagram shows so try to keep it down to one idea at a time try to keep your information balanced in other words you want the chart or table or graph or figure to be visually appealing and the way to do that is to make sure that you are using the space in a way that is balanced for your reader you, you don't want to falsify anything right I mean you represent what the data says but make sure that you're thinking about how it would be visually represented in a balanced way maintain scale you'll see that it's very easy to cheat especially if you start um, at a higher value than the base value or the bottom value for a chart or table I've already said keep it simple you may know the kiss rule keep it keep it simple silly <laughs> it was what my kids would say limit the number of words you use you want to label everything you want to communicate only one idea but you want to do that in as, as uh, efficient communication style as possible and the chart alone should be able to convey what you want to say even though I will always recommend using text to, to describe it but the chart alone should be enough so for example let's just talk about five things that are wrong with this table right? well one thing you're talking about number of siblings here but your result is a percent all right nextly are these mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive well you've got none one two two to six and no answer could there be more than six yes are they collectively exhaustive then no is there any overlap between these categories yes there's a two and there's a two so they're not mutually exclusive there's a problem the way that they're represented here you have some with decimal points and some without right? it would be better if you standardize that this is redundant to to put the percentage sign when you've already said percent here no reason to do that right? make sure that you are uh, thinking about all of these things when you put together a table there are probably some more those are the key ones but whenever you're looking at a table you should start to recognize first of all what is it trying to say how is it saying it and what is the basic information that I need to get this gives incorrect basic information on a couple of levels because we don't know how many people in this 20.3 percent are also in this category here since two and two both exist let's think about four things that are wrong with this bar graph well one it doesn't start at zero and we don't know what the maximum is but maybe it's higher than 40 so it doesn't it's not really to scale second of all you're representing uh, colors here uh, colors here in, in a way that would, would suggest that there's some sort of value to them we don't know what this represents are these percentages is this a frequency is this something else there are different uh, widths to these bars in your column which who knows what that suggests it doesn't seem to suggest anything it would be better if these were spaced uh, the same distance apart and then second of all we have some overlap or some discrepancy in the the categories here of color first of all what is this chart about we have no idea what the idea is but some discrepancies here pastel could be blue pastel green pastel red pastel it could also be light color so they are not mutually exclusive or collectively exhaustive now we can also look at some of the ways that this is represented.